front and center. <laughs> Hand, hands down in front. I know that. I used to do that in undergrad, actually. <laughs> Hello, people. Thank you for attending this iteration of uh, Chair's lecture series. Today it's going to be given to us by <clears throat> one of our newest hires, someone I like to consider a new friend of mine. He has a really good haircut. That's uh, Richard Glenn Urig. Uh, we hired him last year. He started in July of this year? August. August of this year. Um, what should I say about well, Glenn? I'll give you a brief synopsis of where he did his undergrad training. That's honors from Queens. <clears throat> I noticed your project, even then, was on proteomics. Yeah, yeah, there's an element of that. So do you do anything else? Is it just proteomics? <laughs> we'll, we'll see. You'll see we'll today. See. <laughs> we'll see you do, okay. Uh, so you did an MSc uh, also at uh, Queens. Your specialization was in proteins. That's what um, I did. Did your PhD, got in 2013, Greg Moorhead in Calgary. Mm -hmm. So he's not really a foreigner to this province. He's coming back in a way. Uh, I did your PDF from 2013 onwards in Zurich in plant proteomics. And you got your NSERC PDF at some point in that journey? Mm -hmm. While I was there. What's that? While I was there in Switzerland. While you were there. Yeah. And then we encouraged you back. Um, I'm going to say something here. <clears throat> I was his host, actually, for some reason. Um, I'm a fish physiologist, but I hosted this guy for some reason. There's nobody else to host him. <laughs> Welcome. But when you got off the plane and I looked you in the eye, I knew you were a guy. Immediately. <laughs> and thankfully, the committee agreed for some reason. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, he's got a young daughter named. You had it? Oh, the Kiori. Yeah, we got it, all right. And uh, just bought a house not too far away from me, so we're going to be drinking very soon. <laughs> so, Glenn, please give us a talk. All right. All right, so thanks for coming today. Um, I've been working with proteins for a long time, in particular, proteins in plants. And I've used a number of different omics technologies, and so today I'm going to talk more about the omics technology and how now I've been applying it to uh, my work with plants. So, so one of the major overarching themes in plant science still today, I would argue, is to connect phenotypes to the underlying molecular mechanisms. And omics offers an opportunity to do this, as it allows you to look at full complements of proteins or transcripts or metabolites in a given organism here, obviously being a plant, to help make these connections. This is particularly important when it comes to things like agriculture or making discoveries that can help with agriculture as it allows you to assess um, key components of plants that uh, certain in, uh, internal factors and external factors that could be influencing growth and survival, which obviously we want our crops to do, is to grow and survive. Uh, some internal factors that uh, omics can help you assess are things like metabolism. So you can look at whole complements of proteins and how they could be changing related to metabolism. Or the timing of events, very important, things like flowering time. Um, obviously for crops and seasonality, this is an important component. But also external things such as how do we work with a changing environment? We know that this is occurring around the world, so we have to engineer crops in some capacity, either breeding or targeted crop development. To assess these sort of things, such as drought or even resource availability, things like phosphate deprivation or lack of phosphate for our crops, we don't need to apply huge amounts so we can make them more uh, nutrient um, efficient. So what are omics technologies, let's say, kind of broad scale sort of thing? Well, they're tools that offer holistic understanding of molecules that make up a cell tissue or an organism. So these include things like genomics. I'm sure everybody here has kind of heard of genomics in some capacity or another. Transcriptomics, proteomics, which Keith kindly says, a favorite of mine, obviously, and we'll talk about that today, and metabolomics. And these can be used in a targeted and untargeted capacity. So in an untargeted capacity, you would use these technologies to generate hypotheses, whereas in a targeted uh, capacity, you use them to try and uh, direct like hypothesis-driven uh, research. And so functional genomics, you may have heard this term tossed around. It's kind of like an overarching umbrella term, let's say, to describe aspects of untargeted and targeted. But I like to think of it in more of a targeted way, where you're trying to understand how the proteins and genes of your particular question uh, can be assessed using omics. So over the last 15 years, and I say 15 years, let's say, from just after the turn of the millennia, uh, omics technology has exploded, for sure. Um, 
in particular transcriptomic technologies. I'm sure many of you in here have used this in some way or another. Uh, you can see very steep trajectory here where you're now getting, you know, millions of reads to get really deep into the transcriptome or your genome or whatever you're using the technology for. And not only that, the price of doing these uh, experiments has come down. So there's an accessibility factor here uh, to use omics technologies in your own research. In my own favorite area, proteomics, there has been quite uh, technology development as well. We started off using things like gel-based proteomics, uh, where you would f extract your uh, tissue of interest or whoop, tissue of interest, and then you'd separate them on gels, 2D gels or 1D gels in, in different ways, uh, and then you would subject them to mass spectrometry. This at the time was considered high throughput. This is when I started in proteomics back in 2005. It's still used today in some capacities, depending on what technologies you have available. Um, but it did represent a good starting point for proteomics, and it did start to get people to think about how we can label samples and, and compare between different states, so an experimental state versus a wild-type state, for instance. Um, we've since gone on to go gel-free, and this is where the technology has definitely moved to today, where instead of fractionating proteins and gels, we digest the entire sample and we move into doing uh, peptide fractionation uh, using some sort of chromatography uh, upstream of the mass analyzer. This also opened the door for moving from gel-based uh, proteomics to using label and label-free pipelines and has definitely moved more towards what one could argue is high throughput. But there's still, I, I hazard to use that term because I'm sure the technology is going to evolve beyond that and 10 years from now people will be thinking I'm crazy saying that. So since I've been uh, in science working with plants doing proteomics, I, I remember when I first started we were getting uh, hundreds of protein identifications from one uh, mass spec injection. So this is like one mass spec injection here. But now easily we're getting up to something like 3,500 and 4,000 protein IDs. So there's been this quite a huge expansion in terms of our abilities to use mass spec and proteomics to look at uh, cells and tissues and organisms um, at the omics level. So some example workflows some of you may see is um, kind of the hypothesis generating avenue or the targeted avenue. So here we have broad scale global profiling of proteins, maybe over a time course or between conditions. Or you have selected analysis in the same area where you're enriching for a PTM. So PTMs are post-translational modifications. Um, looking at say just phosphorylated proteins or acetylated proteins. As well, you can do focused work where you're affinity purifying a protein complex that you may be interested in. Maybe you tag your protein of interest, express it in your system, and do some pull-downs. On the targeted side, and this is where it gets quite interesting, is instead of uh, enriching and, and doing these sorts of uh, trying to isolate your protein away from the complexity, you can look at your select proteins of interest in complexity. And that's where you get technologies such as selected reaction monitoring, multiple reaction monitoring, and there's a number of iterations of this moving into what I will just talk about later, technologies called SWATH or hyperreaction monitoring. So it's not surprising the cell is a complex environment, and so it's probably good that we can have these omics technologies to get deep into understanding how these cells and how uh, organisms work. So it's perhaps easiest to think of it in a linear sort of way, where we're moving from the genome through the transcriptome through the proteome. And we can think about the cellular processes that uh, facilitate these uh, transitions between these different ohms. But it's also important to consider the fact that each of these ohms individually have some sort of regulation that's occurring within them, or some sort of regulation that is happening between the different ohms. And this is something, ohm intersections or ohm interactions is something that I feel like is lost in the literature sometimes when you see transcriptomic study or proteomic study. I mean, I'm guilty of this, of using this in a title, but it's really a very integrated system that we need to consider from a holistic approach. However, quantifying each and every one of these ohms may be not feasible, so working within each ohm, it's important to still quantify these things to get an understanding of your system. However, despite what omics technologies can offer us, there are still some, to me, what are big gaps, at least in plants. And these have to do with these ohm intersections. How are these ohms connected together? What are the molecules, proteins, and genes that tie them together? So one maybe potentially obvious uh, standpoint would be something like post-translational modifications onto the genome. So someone could think of epigenetics, someone can think of methylation. Methylation is catalyzed by methyltransferases. These are proteins that work in the post-translational modification space. So um, as well, we have to consider ohms 
are not static but dynamically changing. So we have to think of them as over some sort of time course or over a number of conditions. Often I think people look at ohms and they think of them in some sort of static capacity. But with the accessibility of the technologies that we have now and the price point, we should definitely be moving towards doing time course experimentation or doing a, a broader range of conditions when you're, when you're testing out your system. So a good example of how ohms may be intimately connected is the regulation of DNA. And in this picture alone, we have a number of different ohms intersecting. The genome, obviously, we have chromosomes, but we have methyltransferases, as I just mentioned. They can methylate DNA. They can also methylate proteins. There's different types of them. And these create genome changes for accessibility for transcription. As well, we have multiple PTMs that can occur on histones that adjust the chromatin's accessibility for transcription. And then we have even things coming from the metabolome, like hormones, that can then have an effect on gene transcription or on your genome itself. So it's a very integrated system, and uh, I think that people need to, to capture that, and then omics technology allows us to explore this quite a bit. So how to best use omics? This was a something that I started to think about when I was putting this together. And to me, still, model organisms represent kind of the ideal for applying omics. Now, that's definitely not the case in, in the literature today. People definitely use model organisms, but omics now, with the breadth of information that's being generated due to the use of these technologies, is definitely moving into non-model organisms. And you can apply orthology and different sort of bioinformatic pipelines to make inferences into non-model organisms. So I've listed a bunch here. I put them in no particular order because I know that there's a lot of people here that have their favorite. There's a zebrafish. It's not on there. <laughs> Non-model. Um, this, this, <laughs> this right here is, to me, the most important model organism. Okay, Arabidopsis. Everyone hears about this. It's a weed. It's not, you know, you're not going to eat Arabidopsis exactly, but it has a lot of tractable components to it that make it an attractive model system. So I'll give you a little detail. First of all, it was one of the first sequence genomes. It was the first sequence plant genome. There's been a number of iterations in terms of revising this genome. Since it was first sequenced, so it's a highly um, annotated and, and well taken care of genome, so it's reliable. Uh, as well, it's a rapid growth cycle, so you can grow it in a greenhouse, you can grow it in your growth chambers. It's very easy to do, six weeks at 16 hours light, eight hours dark, you'll have seed to seed uh, opportunities. As well, it's diploid, so it's easy to start creating homozygous lines for different traits you might be interested in. As well, it's self-compatible, so it's selfing with itself unless you really force it to be unhappy and you're manually crossing it with different things. Um, as well, there's a lot of resources, and this is probably one of the most important components of why you use a model organism, is when you're doing systems level or you're doing large-scale omics, you want to be able to do bioinformatics to understand or capture what is it your big data is telling you. And having large resources like these are uh, Terra and Rikin, Rikin's in Japan, Terra's in, in the US, they, can, they have huge compendiums of knockout plant lines that have been somewhat characterized. You can order, you can bring in, so if you have targets you want to follow up with. They have full length gene clones, so you can characterize the proteins by cloning. There's a huge research community, there's an entire massive conference, I've attended one of them. Uh, called ICAR, which is um, dedicated solely to Arabidopsis research, where a lot of the new technologies come out, and people use, still use Arabidopsis to characterize those technologies. As well, from a bioinformatics standpoint, there's huge compendiums, one called Phytosome, which has a whole bunch of different plant resources, but in particular, the well-annotated uh, Arabidopsis genome. So you can access a lot of tools through this. So why are plants interesting? Plants are interesting, I assure you. Um, they use light. This is something that not a lot of other things do, and I find that this is an important component to emphasize when you think about plants. Because they harvest light energy, light energy, along with carbon dioxide, to form carbohydrates and, and complex macromolecules to grow and to survive. Um, one of the downsides of plants, unfortunately, though, is they don't move, unlike Groot. Groot moves, right? So, um, if you've seen Guardians of the Galaxy, I guess. Um, so the downside of not being able to move is that they have to find a way to deal with all the stresses that come their way. They can't just up and move to a new location. So the, uh, the fact that they have to deal with these stresses means that they've adapted a number of um, ways of dealing with them, unique ways that maybe an organism that could move would not necessarily have evolved. So given the fact that we know a lot about plants, they use light, we actually don't know so much about the timing, coordination, and regulation of plants' ability to anticipate 
and or respond to like cues. So there's still a whole area of research that needs to be done here. Now there's a lot that has been uncovered from transcriptomics. So transcriptomics of the circadian clock in particular. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Arabidopsis circadian clock, but here it is. And just like us, they have a number of components that basically form a 24-hour photo period that allow uh, the organism to time when light would next be available or when darkness is going to be coming. In addition to the clock though, you have responses that occur in response to the presence of light or the presence of dark. So combined, these form a diurnal regulatory um, effect on the plants. And what I want to do is start to characterize these things a little bit more. So we want to know when and how plant cellular pl processes are regulated throughout the photo period. So this is coming to the timing component and then making connections between those ohms. What are these proteins or genes or molecules that are making these connections? So while I was working at the ETH, I was working with a number of other postdoctoral fellows and we started to think about how we could answer this using proteomics because that's the technology we largely applied. But we wanted to do that in light of the fact that there's a lot of work already done using transcriptomics and start to think about how transcriptomics and proteomics compare in terms of what they're telling you about your biological system. So first off, we wanted to know, is the proteome changing on a daily basis and to what extent? Is it detectable or significant? We want to know what the purpose of this fluctuation is. What are the processes that are being regulated, when they're being regulated? And then getting to the last question is, do these fluctuations in protein levels correspond to what we're observing with transcripts or mRNA? As well, you can't talk about proteins if you don't talk about protein modifications. And protein modifications regulate a protein's function. So we were interested in understanding how, how protein modifications would change in the light or dark. And does this correlate it to protein abundance? A lot of times you might read about PTMs. It's important to know that these people should, who, whatever paper you're reading, they should be assessing the protein abundance as well because just because you see a change in, say, a phosphorylation event, it's important to know, is that actually a change in the phosphorylation event or is there a corresponding change in the protein level as well, which could actually be convoluting your analyses. So to answer these questions, we went about a number of experiments. The first was we looked at circadian clock mutants. Um, we looked at them at the transcript level and proteomic level simultaneously. We used four different clock mutants. And we looked at them at end of day and end of night. And we started to draw these comparisons. Do the transcripts and proteins show us uh, the same sort of effects? We moved away from that afterwards to looking at producing a high resolution proteomic time course because we realized quite quickly that there's lots of transcriptomic time courses but not any proteomic time courses. And because we had the means and the capability, we decided to endeavor to do this. And so not only we did proteomics, but we also looked at some PTMs over a time course as well. And then lastly, based on some of the results we were finding here, we decided to ask a bigger question. Well, we're using rosettes, which is obviously a photosynthetic tissue. You expect light and dark changes in some ways. We started to ask questions like, uh, what is happening here in multiple tissues? So we're looking at photosynthetic, non-photosynthetic tissues. And we started to look at multiple PTMs. We looked at phosphorylation and acetylation. And we say, how are these po uh, post-translational modifications changing at end of day and end of night? So we looked at clock mutants. We ordered these from TEAR. So you can get these from this genomic resource we're talking about to perform some more targeted omics. And uh, we looked at knocking out LHYCCA1 PR9, PR7, TOC1, and GI, and these are core clock components, so they're central to the operation of the clock. We looked, we did RNA sequencing, we did gel-based proteomics, so this was when kind of this other proteomics, this peptide-based proteomics was kind of coming around, so we acquired this just before that. We looked at end of day and end of night. And what we found, interestingly, was a couple of things. There's a number of biologically interesting things, but that's kind of a plant specialization sort of thing, so I'll talk mostly about the systems level stuff that we noticed. In particular, we noticed that in each of the mutants, no matter the time of day or the mutant, the transcripts and the proteins that were changing were totally independent of each other. I say totally, not completely, yeah? So you see independent changes in transcripts and independent changes in proteins. So different complements that are changing. As well, what we started to see is between, uh, or within the transcription changes between different components of the clock we see each clock component regulating different transcripts as well as different proteins, suggesting the clock has this element of modularity to it. And I like this idea, it got me thinking, and got me thinking evolutionarily speaking, because I have some fascination with how molecules and systems evolve over time, at least at the molecular level. And I started to think, okay, well, how did the clock evolve to be as complex as it is, at least in Arabidopsis? And somebody beat me to this, 
I mean, obviously, I'm not the only one thinking about this, right? So uh, this paper came out this year in 2017, and what they, they did was just um, look at basically the complements of core clock components from green algae all the way through uh, land plants. And what they found was that algae had uh, just a core, um, I don't have it up here, let's see if we go back. Algae only have this component here, which is the central part of even the land plant clock, and this component here. So it's a two component system. But as soon as plants reach land, apparently, they started to increase this complexity right away. So moss and bryophytes and these sorts of things start to have more complex clocks almost right away. So I find that kind of fascinating. What is it about coming to land that automatically means that they need to start expanding the complexity of their daily timing events? So that's kind of interesting. They haven't followed this up yet, and I imagine they will, but it would be interesting to see how um, algae, what kind of genes and proteins are being regulated in algae with their two component system versus what's being regulated in Arabidopsis and how maybe this changes over time. We also did some functional overrepresentation analysis to see kind of what, what the broad strokes are in terms of what's changing in these clock mutants. And two things came up that were quite interesting. These are transcription factors and protein kinases, or in general, you can even expand it up here a little bit, even though it's quite sparse. Um, protein uh, modification machinery. And the reason this is interesting is the clock regulates such a broad swath of the Arabidopsis uh, transcriptome. It must have some way of amplifying how it's doing this. And one way it could be doing this is by actually regulating transcription factors that then would go off and regulate other genes, or protein kinases, which then would be out-regulating proteins uh, at the proteomic level. So I found that this was quite an, an interesting systems level uh, result. So given that we had uh, a disconnect between the transcripts that were changing and the proteins that were changing, as well as the potential impact of protein kinases or more broadly uh, PTM machinery, we then moved on to look at, uh, do this fine high resolution time course of proteomics and fossoproteomics. And this is what it looked like. We harvested uh, Rabidopsis rosettes every two hours in quadruple for a 24-hour photo period. It was quite exhausting. And then around the transitions from light to dark, we harvested time points. So these are our minutes here, and these are uh, kind of the Zeitgerber, so um, every two hours here. And so what this we found is we were able to quantify 4,500 proteins and so 2,300 phosphopeptides, of which we found 288 proteins to be significantly changing. And those clustered together uh, into six clusters, which is showing here the trend. It's kind of noisy, but you see red here is the uh, median trend. And then we did, again, higher level analyses to say what are the, um, what um, processes, cellular processes, do the proteins in each of these clusters, what are they involved in? And you see some things that make, I mean, at least sense for sure if you're into plants, nitrate uh, assimilation and, and reductase activity you would expect here in the day something activated because you need to have carbon available to harvest nitrogen. Anyway, so this is a sensible thing. But then when we go to comparing these to the transcript profile of each of these proteins in each of these clusters, we start to see a different trend. And this is just incredibly noisy going across. These are trend lines, but you can see that it's incredibly noisy. So again, we're getting to the point that transcripts don't seem to parallel proteins. And showing this, I zoomed in on a couple here. You can see that, in fact, there's quite a delay between them. And this delay is not a consistent delay. It depends on a number of different factors. So um, here you're seeing a four-hour delay. Here you see almost a 12-hour delay. And again, maybe a four-hour delay between peak transcript, roughly, and the peak protein change. So because you have these disconnects between transcripts and protein, we have to start thinking about is, I know it, transcriptomics allows a, a lot of accessibility. It's reasonably priced. It gives you a really good depth of analysis. But is it really giving you functional information, actionable data that you can then go and do more targeted analyses. And in this case, when it comes to looking at the timing of events, there's definitely a discrepancy between what transcriptomics is telling us and what proteomics is telling us. So then we went on to, again, like I said, look at PTMs. Um, so just a little crash course in PTMs. Um, if you're not familiar, post-translational modifications, chemical modification affecting a protein function. It can do this in a number of different ways. It can induce conformational changes, like activate a protein to be uh, binding a substrate. It can create protein-protein interaction motifs. I bring up 1433 proteins. If you're familiar, you're going to hear about them again shortly. And then uh, it could also induce subcellular localization changes. This is just a flavor of what it can do, but there's a whole, whole bunch of different things that pro protein uh, modifications can do. So what we did is we looked at the, as I showed you in the initial diagram, we looked at the transition points between light to dark and dark to light. 
And what I'm showing you here is one of the networks that came up from the dark to light transition. And so we mapped this uh, onto a network that we derived using a relational database called StringDB. Some of you may be familiar with this, but what StringDB does is it takes all the data that exists out there for an organism and compiles it together to give association scores between genes. So that could be protein interaction data, this could be co-expression data, for instance. And then it builds uh, a relational network. So it's, it's, it's by association, you can't always say that it's an interaction because it depends on the data type. But it allows you to build a backbone from which you can map data onto. And this is another benefit of having kind of a model organism in this sense. So as you can see here, changing from red to blue, we see phosphorylation increasing or decreasing. This is 30 minutes before light, and you can start to see the system already is undergoing very dynamic changes just in that, that one hour time period between 30 minutes before light and 30 minutes after light. And that what these networks, um, or what is changing is these phosphorylation events on things like translational machinery, photosystem, gene expression, so very like central important processes to a cell when you think about how, what they're going to need in the dark or what they're going to need in the light, and then what they're going to need immediately as they transition to uh, a new uh, light scheme. As well, we see a large protein kinase uh, signaling hub. So there's kinases, phosphatases, and some other PTM machinery that's encoded in here, which is quite interesting. So all this was derived from significantly changing um, phosphorylation events. So you do some statistics, you do some corrections, and then you say, what are the, the top hits, right? But what it doesn't tell you is, are you seeing things that you should expect? So we benchmarked our data. I call it benchmarking. But essentially, we, you look for things that you should expect to be there based on literature. And the literature for phototropins, nitrate reductases, and ATP synthases is quite extensive. And not only is it extensive, they actually have tracked phosphorylation in a diurnal way. So in a targeted experiment, but they, they never, nevertheless uh, trace these. The reason I said 1433 is that all of these proteins are 1433 uh, binding. And phototropin is phosphorylated during the day when it binds 1433s. And then you have nitrate reductase and ATP synthase, which are phosphorylated in the night. Uh, to prevent them from being active, but then they get dephosphorylated during the day to become active to, in this case, acquire nitrogen, and then become active to uh, create ATP. So in summary, what this, is, this experiment has given us is peak time of day protein abundance information for cellular processes. It's given us proteins that are undergoing dynamic reversible phosphorylation at these transitions. But perhaps most importantly, it now gives us new information to augment some of the modeling that's been going on using transcriptomic data. So there's a lot of, in Arabidopsis, people are trying to create growth models or pathogen resistance models, things that can help us in agriculture, essentially. And they're doing this using transcriptomic data, but perhaps proteomic data may be something that could be useful to augment these, these models and, and what they're predicting. Lastly, we moved into doing some targeted PTM stuff. And what happened here is we decided to go after two PTMs, phosphorylation and acetylation. The rationale for choosing these is these are currently the two most abundant post-translational modifications that are found in plants, and I think in all eukaryotes in general. We wanted to understand how, or sorry, we wanted to understand what was acetylated, what was phosphorylated, or if things were both phosphorylated and acetylated, and we wanted to know how those things changed, and we wanted to know how that worked using multiple tissues. So we looked at flowers, we looked at siliques, we looked at rosettes, we looked at roots, and we looked at seedlings. So seedlings obviously not exactly a tissue, but for the sake of presentation, I'm going to be calling this a tissue here. So what we saw was somewhat predictably based on what we already know about phosphorylation. It's uh, extensively changing end of day, end of night, regardless of being in a photosynthetic tissue. Whereas uh, where we see the most significant changes occurring to the acetylome is actually in seedlings, where you have a fairly large component of non-photosynthetic tissue and roots. And I, I don't get into this in the presentation, but it's interesting because acetylation seems to occur more on metabolic enzymes than phosphorylation does in terms of just uh, where these events are occurring. And I think that's kind of interesting as, uh, in the sense that to have an acetylation event, you need to have acetyl-CoA available. And acetyl-CoA is a highly valuable metabolite that's co compartmentalized within the cell. So there could be some interesting connections between metabolism and how there's decisions made between using acetyl-CoA for metabolic purposes and for regulatory purposes. The other thing we wanted to look at is how much of the phosphoproteome do you see in all tissues and the acetylome in all tissues. And so what we see is, in fact, there's a lot more uh, overlap. A lot more of the same proteins are phosphorylated in different tissues than we see with acetylation. So this could mean that there's more specialization that's occurring here 
um, with the, with the, uh, the acetylone. This is very high order stuff. Obviously, there's a lot of, we're tracking events here. We're not tracking necessarily what the function of those events are, right? So people have to go in and do more targeted analysis to find out what is this phosphorylation event really doing. We also looked at how phosphorylation and acetylation may intersect. So we tried to find out how many proteins, in fact, are phosphorylated and acetylated. And we found that there was 134 of these and that some of them actually are undergoing dynamic changes end of day and end of night, either with phosphorylation and acetylation or independent of each other. So there's a really complex situation here. Nonetheless, I think the point is made that you can't just think again of the ohms independently. You can't think of post-translational modifications independently. It's a very integrated system. It's very complex. So here we have uh, key processes like light harvesting, transcription, translation, metabolism, and transport. And all these things have the inputs from phosphorylation events and acetylation events. So in summary, from these three experiments, what we came out with is essentially that the clock is modular, which is, I think, an interesting evolutionary uh, question that other people will probably follow up. But the key systems level thing for omics is that transcripts and proteins don't really correlate. We also know now that maybe the clock is extending its control out into the cell by <coughs> regulating transcription factors and other protein kinases and other PTM machinery. From our time course, we now again saw transcripts and proteins are not correlating. Now, this is in a light-related thing. That doesn't mean that maybe in other situations there could be more correlation, but in what we're seeing is not the case. Um, we see time of day abundance changes and that now we have these uh, protein information that we can use to augment modeling for future uh, applications. And then lastly, we did this multi-tissue, multi-PTM analysis, and we see that there are multiple PTMs diurnally regulated across tissues and that there is some intersection between these two very abundant PTMs. So moving forward, kind of future perspectives here. Um, as I mentioned before, it's these interactions between the ohms that really interest me and identifying what are these regulatory proteins. So we have our ohms here. We have our cellular processes that help facilitate the movement between these. But then we have a whole bunch of regulatory proteins that, that have to be impacting this system. So it's not just those that are, are translating. We're talking about transcription factors, protein kinases, acetyltransferases all sorts of things that are directly impacting these processes. And these are just an example. And then I want to know more about when those regulatory proteins are impacting these systems um, during the day or during the night. So using time course uh, sort of experimentation. And to do this, I think one important technology that needs to keep moving forward to make it more accessible for people is again proteomics. And clearly based on my CV, I've been making this argument for a long time. Um, <laughs> but I think we're getting there now that we can see thousands and thousands of proteins, not just hundreds. And, and so here are some of these technologies that you can use. So we have this multiple reaction monitoring, and this is kind of like SRM, selected reaction monitoring, was one of the first targeted proteomics uh, technologies. And here it's, it's very complex, takes a lot of optimization. And since technology has advanced, we now have PRM, where basically you can track your favorite protein very easily across hundreds of conditions. You can quantify its change. Um, DDA, so this is data dependent acquisition. This is your shotgun proteomic approach, where basically you di di uh, digest your sample, you inject it into the mass spec, and then you're identifying protein. So it's a similar thing here as the PRM. But the most advanced and where I think that most proteomics is going to be going, at least it has gone this way in medicine, for sure, cancer biology, implants, and other systems, it'll inevitably go this direction, is this data independent acquisition. So in this case, what we're doing is you basically collect information on, on all peptides that are there over a given window. And then you work back doing bioinformatics to find out what exactly is changing. So maybe a better depiction of this is here. I like this example. So in a DDA pipeline, you tell the mass spectrometer, you give it some parameters to select for your parent ions. So they'll select here, in this case, selecting one, two, and three, because they're high abundant, they're above this threshold. It then sends each one of these for fragmentation and MSMS analysis, and that's where you get your peptide sequence. DIA, or this technology called SWATH, or HRM, uh, basically takes an entire swath of peptides, the entire range, fragments everything, collects data on everything, so you miss nothing. And essentially what this ends up with is a huge <laughs> requirement for computational capacity, but you end up with this very dense data matrix. So here you would have your DDA, which works and has worked for a long time. But how, uh, what you end up doing is if you have missing values, you have to do technical injection. So technical replicates, same injection of the sample to try and balance that out. 
or you can use computational imputation to predict what these values could be to kind of reduce that matrix. But what DIA does is it eliminates that and uses only biological data to make inferences about quantitation. Here is SRM, MR, MRM, which is showing the same sort of thing. So you're seeing for whatever 20 proteins you're interested in, in a complex sample, you can see them across all your experimental conditions. And the last thing that uh, has to do with this that I thought was really nice is if you're trying to look at the Mona Lisa, you have this very fragmented sort of situation, but here you have um, a very clear picture of what's going on because you have all the data to be able to make that picture very clear. And so there's lots to do, lots to move on with, uh, lots of technologies out there that can be implemented. I'm very excited about the proteomic space. I think it's finally taking off. But here uh, are some of the people that helped make this work. In particular, the Functional Genomics Center in Zurich. This is a, a center that's run between the University of Zurich and the ETH. And they have an um, incredible team there that have really helped push this technolo these technologies forward. As well as people that work directly with in the lab. So Sierra is one of the postdocs I was talking about. Alex Graff, Deanna Komen, uh, all these people were central in, in working through all this data. So, still lots to do, but uh, yeah, that's it for now. So, thank you. Questions for Glenn? Yeah. So, you saw variation in the proteome, but not in the transcript, or the variation in the transcript was not related. Where are the transcripts for those proteins? So those transcripts are there. They are changing on some level. It could be very small. But the actual major change is at the protein, the protein level. So in that situation, what you could have is a reduction in protein degradation, for instance, which is something I don't talk about because we can't address it with the data that we've acquired. But protein turnover is a major facet of proteomics, which is, is quite interesting. And that might be one of the reasons why you see these, these disconnects, for sure. I think that's a temporal issue. It's also a temporal issue as well, yeah. So you'll see transcripts first. Obviously, you need transcripts before you're going to get the protein, right? But there's a whole bunch of regulation that occurs between so, these two things. I mean, if you tighten up the, that temporal difference between those two things, then you should get a better relationship between them, right? Yes, but this is the thing is the cell is, it's kind of a, it's, there's so many different things. It's very independent. So you have like one protein. If you're looking at one gene, it could be that that gene is transcribed. Maybe it has no introns, which do exist. It gets instantly translated to protein. So you see a very tight correlation. Others have lots of splicing needs, complex folding, whatever. Before, well, folding comes after. Sure, but sure. So the temporal window depends on, it's in, it's on the each, specifics of those. Yes, systems. on each of the systems, yeah. But I guess the broader point I was making is that people are making a lot of assumptions about if you see transcripts speaking here, that must mean that the protein is working there. And that's what we need to be cognizant of, this complexity that exists beyond just making that statement. So in DIA, you can get around this dynamic range thing to some degree because you're collecting everything. DDA has that bias where if you have highly abundant proteins, you will always be selecting those over anything that's lower abundant. And that's kind of why this DIA gives you this better result in some ways. You, yeah, you still are limited by your ability to, I mean, you can extend chromatography, timelines, these sorts of things to try and uh, get around that. But yes, you're not going to see all the things that transcriptomics is going to see based on the technology available today, for sure. The, the DIA presented as sort of the go forward technology, is that part of a like, differential abundance pipeline? Are you able to easily produce differential abundances of proteins? It's exactly, exactly. So the differential abundance has to come from either using a label or a non-label. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, isobaric labeling stuff. So you can do it with uh, an unlabeled uh, sample very easily. Yeah. This is very much evolving. I got to tell you, so I went to a workshop just actually before I came here, and they had all the five leaders in the world there presenting on this. And they actually are working together, oddly enough, even though they have kind of competing interests, to kind of push this technology forward because they wanted to make sure everybody's on the same page with the ability to do certain things and that nobody's lagging behind in terms of their ability to uh, implement this sort of 
pipeline. So, so it is moving forward very quickly and is going to have, I think, this is the future. They call this next generation proteomics. I didn't want to use that. I thought that was kind of a rip off from the transcriptomics, but that's kind of where, where people are leaning with this. Um, so you're working on a 12 hour cycle and at 11 hours, the cells are already knowing that at 12, things are going to shift. Is there any idea about what the, the counting mechanism or the, the memory mechanism is? Because you're taking samples you know, throughout that time period. Is there anything there that's changing that might give you a hint as to what's happening? So they are anticipating, they are entrained. It's not completely, the clock is not completely light independent. So they need to know, they need to have that zap to know when the day is going to start so they know the next day, how to anticipate the next day. So it, it basically starts this system up. So an hour before, they will start to change, at least transcriptionally they've shown um, that these... Right, there's, there's something in this system that's saying it's coming, it's coming, and then the, the, the gate opens. It's literally the timing of this, and I don't know, go back so easily. It's, it's that each one of those transcription factors has a specific timed profile, one after another, and they repress each other in some capacity. So essentially you end up with, oh my goodness, it's going to take forever. One second, go back here. Yeah, so, so it's, a, it's, a feedback loop. it's a feedback loop, a negative feedback loop, and that's how they know. And then here you have light. This is kind of the most important component of the whole system. You see the biggest change when you knock out LHY and CCA1. Yeah, that's how they get the timing down. Well, thank you, Glenn. That was great. Okay, Thanks for coming.